and the altar are given to the glory of God in thanksgiving for the lives of the Reverend David Hamilton and Lilia Garcia, given by Anne, Jane, Raphael, and family. The flowers in the chancel are placed in celebration for Don Inglis' 80th birthday, which was on February 5th, given by his daughter, Sandy. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all the also with you. you. Almighty God, to you all might sorrow, all, all desires and hope, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, healed the sick and restored them to wholeness of life, look with compassion on the anguish of the world, and by your power make whole all peoples and nations, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. If I could please be seated, and my God, please come forward. Good morning. I have a question for you. What makes you happy? Does a new toy make you happy? Chocolate. What happens when that toy breaks, or when you get bored of it? Does that mean you're not happy anymore? <laughs> Some people think money makes them happy. This is Monopoly money because I don't have hundreds lying around my house to show you. <laughs> Some people think money makes them happy because then they can buy all the stuff they want to buy. And what happens to that stuff? That stuff sometimes breaks just like your toys do or you get bored of it or you don't need it anymore. Does that mean you're not happy? Some people think food makes them happy. I think chips and dark chocolate make me happy. <laughs> but what happens when the chips are all gone and the dark chocolate's all gone? Does that mean I'm not happy anymore? I want more, that's for sure. Some people think being popular at school makes them happy when all the kids really like them. But what happens when some other kid comes along and does something really cool and now all the kids are liking them? Does that mean you're not happy anymore because you're not the popular one? God asks us to really think about what makes you happy. Do we need to rely on the stuff of this world to make us happy? Or can we find happiness much deeper inside? We're happy because we know that God loves us, that God's always there for us, and God asks us to take care of one another. God is with us in the bad times when we're sad or we need help and we pray for help or guidance. But we also have to remember that God is with us in the good times too, and we need to continue to pray for guidance. So whether we have lots of money or lots of food or no food or no money, it shouldn't matter. We need to continue to pray for God for guidance. And that happiness that God loves us and is with us is always sitting inside of us. And we're not dependent on those things. So let's say a prayer. Creator God, help us to remember that we can never find happiness by seeking the things of this world. True happiness can only be ours by following Jesus and living God's way. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah contrasts those who trust in mortals and those who trust in the Lord. Thus says the Lord,
Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness, in an un uninhabited salt land. Blessed are, are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of the drought, it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. In the heart of the devious, above all else, it is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruits of their doings. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Please join me as we pray together Psalm 1, prayed responsibly. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on this law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed. Paul proclaims the truth of Christ's resurrection. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and, it, and you are still in your sins then those who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with the great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea 
Jerusalem and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him, to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, revile you and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when people speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Lord, take our minds and think through them. Lord, take our hearts and fill them with love for you. Amen. Amen. Gospel is a word which means good news. For thousands of years now, today's gospel has been proclaimed as good news for the poor. What's the good news for the poor that's proclaimed? The good news is that if you are poor, if you are mourning, if you are wounded, rejected or excluded, then God's heart is with you and God is for you. But where does this gospel leave us though if we just happen to be all comfortable, prosperous, perhaps even wealthy? Where does it leave those of us who, well, sometimes people speak well of or about? Where does this leave those of us who not only have full bellies, but over full bellies? And where does that leave those of us who sometimes laugh, perhaps even frequently? I remember a parishioner, wonderful older man, who'd been quite successful in his life, came to me one day and says, does this mean that I need to get poor, hated, unhappy, and hungry in order to be loved by God? (laughs) The truth is, I said to him, you know, God even loves rich people and those who are full and popular, like him. One day, a rich young man comes to Jesus You might know this story. So he wants to know, Jesus, what he must do to inherit eternal life. But before answering the question, what does Jesus do? Jesus looks deeply into the eyes of this young man and the gospel says he loved him. Before answering, Jesus loved him. Jesus loved him so much, in fact, that Jesus would grieve over the decision this young man would take to eventually not follow in the way of Jesus, since he was apparently held captive by all of his possessions. Jesus grieved then not because he wanted or needed his possessions. Jesus didn't want or need his possessions. He grieved because Jesus wanted him to experience a fuller and a better life than he had. Back to the question though, where does this sermon from Jesus leave us who are rich and full? Well, one of the first things that we usually do when we read a passage like this is we say something like, well, I'm not so rich or so full. And so thankfully these woes of Jesus don't apply to me. Well, the truth is 
There is always someone richer and fuller than us. But what's really behind that rationale we offer ourselves is we just don't want to be the subject of the woes. We don't want to be challenged by Jesus in today's gospel. The reality is, and the truth of the situation is, that we here in this part of the world are amongst the richest in human history. The richest in human history we are. You've probably heard these statistics before, but if we own a car, if we have a university degree, if we live in our own home, if we have access to medical care, if we take an annual holiday, and if we have more than one month's salary saved, then we are amongst the world's richest and fullest people. So what do we do about this? Is it about feeling guilty? Or is it about asking ourselves, how can we more fully love and serve God, even as we recognize ourselves to be amongst the rich and the full? In my reading of the scriptures, which speak to the issue of how we relate to our possessions, I see several trends. One of the first trends I see in the scriptures is God's persistence call to social justice and generosity. The most significant text comes from the Acts of the Apostles, which was also written by Luke, by the way, in which Luke tells us that that very first community of Christians always understood their possessions to be a resource for the whole community. And so Luke says that nobody was reported to have ever went without. The other dominant theme in the scriptures about our possessions is that God knows how easily we are prone to idolatry. And our wealth in particular can very easily become an idol. What is it that idols demand of us? Idols demand absolute loyalty and obedience. Nothing can come between us and what our idols demand. Think, for instance, of how often our pursuit of wealth can deprive our families of the attention they deserve. Think of how our pursuit of wealth can damage our health, hamper our efforts to build community, and most importantly, how treating wealth as an idol takes the place of God in our life. You might also remember how one day Jesus would say this to his followers, we cannot serve both God and mammon. And mammon is a great old Hebrew word for wealth, representing as an idol. Well, what Jesus is teaching here is that only God can satisfy our deepest desire. If we truly want to be wise in the way of Jesus, then we would want to pursue him more and things less. Finally, what possessions can do is they can lead us to believe that our trust and our security is found not in God, but in what we own, earn, or accumulate. In our first reading from Jeremiah, those who trust in their own strength are described by the prophet as like a shrub in the desert. When the elements get harsh in the desert, these shrubs wither and die. In contrast, those who trust in the Lord are like, quote, a tree planted by a stream of water. And unlike that shrub planted in the, in the desert, these trees can withstand the harshest of elements since their roots are long and deep. So too it is for us who follow in the way of Jesus, for we are rooting our strength not in our possessions, but in God. We also know, sometimes from personal experience, that even the most financially secure amongst us is still vulnerable to a whole series of events beyond our control, where all of what we have can be taken from us. We all know people this has happened to, and truth be told, it has also happened to some of us. Christian then are wise who root their strength not in what they own but who they are before God. 
So after hearing all this today, is the gospel still good news? It absolutely is good news. And it's good news for everyone. It's good news for the poor and for the rich, for the hungry and for the full. It's good news for those who are rejected and for those who are held in high esteem. But it can only be seen as good news if we come to understand that at the very heart of Jesus' gospel is a great paradox. And the paradox is this. If we want to be full, then we need to be hungry for God. If we want to be rich, then we need to learn to give more of it away. If we want to be exalted or honored, then we must be prepared to be humble. And ultimately, if we want to live, then we must be prepared to die. Or to paraphrase a passage from Philippians, what the world counts as loss, we will always count as gain. May Jesus, who gave up everything for us, so that we might gain life abundantly, help us to grow more fully into this vision of his kingdom, which we hear about today in his sermon on the plain. In his name we pray. Amen. challenges and rewards of living by faith. Knowing our need of God, let us pray. Father, we bring to mind our church, both here in Ancaster and throughout the world. It is for right values, right priorities, and right relations that we pray in all we decide and do. Lord our God, in you you provide our trust. trust. We bring to mind all who lead and govern, and all meetings that are important decisions are made. We give thanks for Queen Elizabeth on the 70th anniversary of her coronation. We pray for peace in the Ukraine, and for Canadian soldiers stationed in East Europe. We pray for peace in Canada, where people are feeling divided, unheard, and unvalued. We pray that justice and mercy are upheld in line with your loving will. Lord our God, in you we our trust. We bring to mind our circle of family and friends with whom we share the good and difficult times. We pray for the grace to discern more readily the good in each person and the gifts they have to offer. We celebrate Don Inglis on his 80th birthday. We pray for Mark McConnell and for Joseph Duyuyangu and their doctors for healing and wellness. We now call to mind all who are in need of our prayers, who are close in our thoughts and hearts. Lord our God, in you we put our trust. We bring to mind those caught up in the forensic pressures of life, those who are stressed to breaking points. We pray for insight and courage to change things. 
Lord our God, in you we put our trust. We bring to mind the dying, especially those who are alone, and we remember those we know who have died. We pray for the family of David Shoesmith, brother of Barbara Van Dyke. May they and we share in the everlasting joy of your presence. Lord our God, and in you we put our trust. We thank you, Father, for all the wise teachings you have given us through Christ. Give us grace to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. As we prepare the table, our hymn will be Shepherd of Sons, Refresh and Bless. <laughs> Eternal God, you are the strength of the weak, 
and the comfort of suffers, receive all we offer you this day. Turn our sickness into love and our sorrow into joy. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And all the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth. You are the source of light and life for all your creation. You made us in your own image and call us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Oh 
wherever you may be, and in the silence of your hearts, to make your own act of communion with Christ.
Thanks be to God.